Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. You never change. You never fail, oh God. True are your promises. True are your promises. You never change. You never fail, oh God. So we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. So we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. Wide is your love and grace. Wide is your love and grace. You never change. You never fail, oh God. Wide is your love and grace. Wide is your love and grace. You never change. You never fail, oh God. So we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. So we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to you were, you are, you will always be. You were, you are, you are, you will always be. You were, you are, you will always be. So we. Faithfulness, O oh God, you wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy, and nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough. salvation and all your feet 
people sing along so still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received the reconciliation.
Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who are afar off and to those who were near, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father.
Lord, you are great and you're greatly to be praised. And my prayer this morning is that's what would be in each of our hearts here in this room today, that we've come for no other reason but to praise you, God, to give you the glory that's due to your name because you're holy, Lord, and we are not holy. And while we were still far off, you came and saved us, Lord. And while we were your enemies, you did things for us that most people wouldn't even do for a friend, not even someone they love. And God, we just thank you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Kids, you can go out for Children's Church. Well, good morning, everyone. How you guys doing? Great to see you today. Glad that you're here. Thank you for coming. If you're uh, joining online, uh, we, we're glad you're here. Thanks for coming to True Life and uh, welcome. If you're first time here, we want you to know we're really, really glad that you're here. and We, we welcome you to True Life Church and uh, hope that you feel a warm welcome, that you'll come back and join us and be with us. Uh, thank God for today. Amen. Everybody, everybody awake, everybody dry. I mean, nobody's, everybody's okay. Okay, good. So we're, we're drawing to a close in, uh, the series that we'd be going through called 40 days of prayer. We've been doing this in our worship times and also in our small groups. It's been great. I've really enjoyed it. Have you enjoyed this series? I've really enjoyed this series. It's been a blessing to me and, and uh, really challenged me to remind me about what's really important, you know, and, and uh, just thank God for it. Uh, Jimmy's done a great job. Preston last week uh, knocked it out of the park. Really appreciate the, the application that he brought to the message that he brought last week. We've seen practical guidelines for an effective prayer life. We've seen the posture of prayer, the, pat the pattern of prayer, uh, basically in the Lord's model of prayer, Matthew 6, including who we're praying to, our Heavenly Father, our, our Heavenly Abba, Daddy, you know, and, and we've talked about the prayer of surrender. We've, we've looked last week at our, our praying for our needs. Today, we're looking at this topic, and it really is a, basically a topical message though uh, I'll be trying to exposit some of the, the passages that we're looking at. But uh, we're looking at this topic, strategic prayer. Strategic prayer. So I want to remind you that the model prayer that we've already looked at begins and ends with the glory of God. The honor, the praise, the worship and glory of Almighty God. And so we don't need to lose sight of that. We need to remember, and I want to remind you again that, you know, prayer is not about manipulating God to, to do our will, but rather being conformed uh, in prayer so that we line up with the will of God, not the, not the other way around. We need to remember those things. And you know, I, I remember well when we were in Ouagadougou. Uh, the capital of Burkina Faso. We were missionaries over 14 years with the IMB, and the last stint we were in Ouagadougou. Well, we were in Burkina Faso at first. We were in Ouagadougou, and and we. I remember hearing the news from our leadership that we were going to need to move again. You see, um, the first country that we had gone to was uh, Cote d'Ivoire. That's the French for Ivory Coast. It's in West Africa. And, uh, and, and we served there. War had broken out in the Ivory Coast where we were originally stationed working among the Beer Four people. The Beer Four people. Everybody say Beer Four. Yeah. So, and so we, you know, war broke out and we... We're actually out of the country when it happened. You know, the coup was taking place, and, and we heard that the rebels had taken over the, 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 or the north and were moving in the direction of the town that we had been, that we were lived in, that we, staged, we were stationed in. And so, uh, 
basically what happened was they took over that whole area. And we were basically left homeless and missionary refugees, if you will. Uh, I mean, that's just the way it was. And so we, we moved over into the country to the east of us, Ghana, uh, which used to be called Gold Coast. And so, you know, we moved over there and, and we stayed in the, in the Baptist guest house there for a little while. And for about four months, we were there before going back stateside where we traveled for a year of speaking and raising awareness and support for missions, moving around and that sort of thing. We moved three times, lived in three different places while we were stateside, Florida, uh, uh, Tennessee, and, and Mississippi. And then when it was time to go back, our leadership asked us to go to Ouagadougou, the capital city, and help. A, a new pioneer team that was training pastors, doing research among the unreached people groups of that country, training pastors and churches to, to lead their churches to go into these unreached people groups uh, with the gospel and plant churches. And so that moved on for a while. But then we, we uh, you know, after, after about nine months, and a colleague of mine and I, studied French because it was a French-speaking country, and so uh, we studied French for nine months and did the research, and then we were told, uh, you know, you're going to need to move. We're, we're bringing this uh, team to a close, and you have the option to go back to the beer for people where you were before, only on this side of the border, not over in where the, the, the rebels are and stuff. And, and, or, those, or that kind of thing. Or you can go to a new people group, maybe one of these people groups that you've been researching. And so I called, either way, we had to move again. I called our family together and I, I told them what we were looking at. We had, you know, we had become homeless and refugees and, and had been for the last, uh, you know, 18 months or so, moved nine times not to speak of the times that we traveled around here in the States to speak to churches and, and all of those things. And two of those times that we moved were transcontinental. And so, you know, we and in Ouagadougou, we had started sort of uh, getting our roots in and establishing and making friends and getting into a routine. And we thought that we were going to be settled. And then the fact was that they were asking us to move again. So I shared that with our family. And Aletha, our oldest daughter, said, I don't want to move again. And really, she was speaking for all of us. And so, um, so I, I just reminded the, my family of, of, of something I read about George Mueller that he had said, you know, that when you're searching God's will, seeking God's will, you just need to let your will die in the dust. And he said, I try to get to a place where I have no, no will of my own and just open up and, and see where God would, what His will is. Let me read a little bit of what you said. He said, nine-tenths of the trouble with people generally is just here. Nine-tenths of the difficulties are overcome when our hearts are ready to do the, the Lord's will, whatever it may be. So we, we spent some time as a family agonizing in prayer, trying to get to that point where we were just, you know, in the dust before the Lord, seeking, Lord, what is your will? Show us what you want. We talked about it. We prayed about it. And that, that Christmas... The week before Christmas, we moved our family down to Leo, Burkina Faso, where the Walla people lived and, and began work as church planters among the Walla people. Pastor Phillip's going to talk about missions today. Well, I get, you know, what do you expect? The, you know, the missionary is going to speak on missions, you know. The, I guess you can kind of figure that, right? Well... Strategic prayer begins with a relationship with the living God and surrender to His will and plan to reach the lost, the unreached peoples of the world and bring them into reconciliation 
with Himself. That's strategic prayer. That's where it begins and that's where it ends. Is, is being drawn into the heart of God, knowing His will, knowing His plan, knowing His heart, and then getting our will in conformity to His will. We talked about, you know, that, str- that surrender, that prayer surrender already. But really that's where we had to come to. And that's what brings Him honor and glory. Adrian Rogers said, Prayer can do anything God can do. And God can do anything. Amen. He also said this. He said, Prayer begins and ends with God. We just complete the circuit. We just need to get in line with God's will and complete the circuit and cry out to God. Amen? So I want us to look at three things today. Number one, God's heart for the nations. All through Scripture, we see how God called people to Himself and invited them. He called them to be on mission with Him to reach the nations with His saving power. John Piper wrote an article in 1991 about the many times and usages of the word Gentiles. And the New Testament word is ta-etne. He, he, he used it, he, he, he saw this, and he, he looked at it, studied it in Scripture. Gentiles, in some usages, is the general term for all non-Jews. Anyone who is not a Jew. That is the, one of the general usages of this word. But it, in many of the usages of the word, in the word of God, it is better understood nations or peoples, ethnic groups, tribes, or, or even clans. And so, this becomes very important in our understanding of the heart of God for the nations. I want us to look at some of the examples of this. First of all, let's look at the example of, 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 of Abraham when God made a promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 3. He said, Now the Lord has said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And watch this. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That word families there. It can be translated peoples or tribes or even a smaller subgroup, clans. And this promise is repeated in Genesis 18, chapter 22, chapter 26, and also chapter 28. He repeats it over. How is this promise fulfilled? How do we see in Scripture? Well, we see by the Scriptures that the Holy Spirit gave uh, to the apostles how it was fulfilled. Peter quoted it in, in Acts chapter 3, verse 25. He said, you are sons of the prophets. He was speaking uh, there in Jerusalem. He said, you are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made our father, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He was preaching the gospel. He was preaching Christ and Him crucified and resurrected. To them. And so the application was, this was the fulfillment to, of, of the promise to Abraham. And which had come to all the nations of the earth living there in Jerusalem. It says there were men from every nation under, under, under heaven there that day of Pentecost. Paul quoted the same promise in uh, Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. The Apostle Paul, he said, Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. In you all the nations shall be blessed. Notice the two different usages in this one verse. Same ta etne, but one is the general usage of all non-Jews. 
the Gentiles, the other is the uses of all nations, the people groups, the ethnic groups, the tribes. Same, same phrase, same uh, construction, but two different usages, two different uh, meanings. And almost all of the English translations have it separated like that. Gentiles, nations. Gentiles, peoples. Paul was saying that the promise that all the nations shall be blessed was coming to fulfillment in the fact that the Gentiles, the other peoples of the earth, were coming to Christ and coming to salvation. The promise was being fulfilled. Folks, this is, this is the promise of God. This is the heart of God. That the nations may rejoice and worship and give praise and honor and glory to His name. For time's sake, let's skip by uh, Psalm 61. We're going to go to the examples in the Revelation to John. Revelation 5, 9 through 10. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Let me give you a news blurb. We win. Amen. <laughs> we, we fight from victory, not for victory. The battle's already been won. Hallelujah. But do you see God's purpose and His plan in this verse? That every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation will be around the throne. You see it again in, in Revelation 7, verses 9 through 10. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, there it is again, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise His name. Folks, it is going to happen. Because it has already been set down in the Word of God. And we're going to see every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation around the throne of the Lamb giving Him praise, giving Him worship. That's something to get excited about. But you know what? It's not going to happen the end will not come, according to Matthew 24, until all of those nations, all of those peoples have worshipers. That's motivation for me to get out there and tell some. Amen? To get out to those unreached peoples, those who have not yet heard. Let's look at examples in, in Paul's holy writings. Romans 15, 8 through 12. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision. In other words, to the Jews. This is a, a reference uh, to his atoning work on the cross and, and his resurrection. And, and then it says, for the truth of God. Why? It gives two reasons. To confirm the promises made to the fathers. And secondly, that the Gentiles, the nations, the peoples, might glorify God for His mercy. Then in verses 9 through 12, watch how Paul pulls together four Old Testament quotes to bring the point home. And he, and he says... Uh, you know, to show how God's purpose was for all the peoples of the earth to come to Him and through faith in Christ to give Him the worship and praise that He deserves. In verse 9, He said, For this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name unto the, among the Gentiles, among the nations. That's a quote from uh, Psalm 18, 49. And then verse 10, and again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, O peoples, O nations, with this people, with His people. In Deuteronomy 20, uh, 32, verse 43. In verse 11, and again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud Him, all you peoples. 
That's a quote from Psalm 117 verse 1. And again in verse 12, Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he who, who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, over the nations. In him the Gentiles, or the nations, shall hope. And that's a quote from Isaiah 11 verse 10. And then Paul goes further in the same chapter. In uh, verses 18 through 21, he, he explains how his understanding of what God's calling uh, as a missionary was on his life. You remember how God called him on the road to Damascus and sent him and, and, uh, and, 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 all, and the blinders fell off his eyes and he saw the Lord, he saw the Lord on the road and then, and then God healed him and said, I'm sending you to the nations. And in these verses, he explains his understanding of that calling and how it's been fleshed out in his life. Look at it in verses 18 to 21. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make Gentiles or the nations obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum I have fully Preach the gospel of Christ. Did you see that? He said, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. What, what's he saying? What does this mean? Does that mean that, that all the towns that he went to, in the, all of those towns, everyone in those towns came to faith in Jesus Christ? Is that what it means? No, of course not. So what is he saying? He, it, what it does mean is that he went to all those places and faithfully preached the Word of God and there were in those places, all of those places, believers who came to Christ. There, was, there were a group of believers, a, a church, if you will, that, that was formed in those places. And so he could say, I fully preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on, he says, And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see. And those who have not heard shall understand. Also a quote from Isaiah 52 verse 15. Folks, the point here is crystal clear. Paul's understanding of his own call, his own missionary call, and his understanding of the heart of God was that all the peoples of all the earth would have the opportunity to respond to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and to come to faith in Him. It's the heart of God. And then look at the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20. Consider what the Lord Jesus Himself, our great commander in chief, after He rose from the grave and defeated, had victory over Satan, sin, death, hell, and the grave, He stood and said to His disciples, Go and make disciples of all the earth. All, all the nations, make disciples of all the nations, pontata ethne. It's the same phrase that we've been talking about. All the nations, all the peoples, all the ethnic groups of the earth, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you all the way to the end of the earth, age. Even to the end of the age. Jesus, great... Commission, the great commission to his followers. Someone said, His last command is our first priority. I think that's pretty good. The heart of God, strategic prayer, is all about the heart of God. That all the nations of the earth hear the gospel and come to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. He sends us. He calls us to Himself and puts us on mission with Him. His desire, His heart, His mission is for all the nations. 
He calls us to himself. And then from his heart of love and compassion and grace and mercy, sends us out. His heart is that there might be worshippers from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation on earth giving praise and glory to the Lamb who sits on the throne. Strategic prayer flows out of the strategic plan and purpose of God. And then consider the great prayer movements in Christian history. First of all, just Pentecost, right? In, in the book of Acts, chapters 1 and 2, Jesus told the disciples to wait for the promise of the Father. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit in chapter 1. So after His ascension back into glory, they gathered into the upper, upper room and devoted themselves to prayer. And then it comes to chapter 2 and said they were all together in, in unity and prayer. And, and the Holy Spirit came upon them and filled them. And they began to preach and the, the nations, it says all the nations of the earth gathered in, in a crowd to hear them preach. And they heard in their own language the gospel. And about 3,000 were saved. Someone has, someone has said, you know, the early church prayed 10 days and preached for 10 minutes. And about 3,000 were saved. We're more likely to pray for 10 minutes and preach for 10 days and wonder why hardly anyone gets saved. Have we turned things around in terms of strategic prayer to make us think that it's all about us? not what we can do, but what He can do. Amen? Consider, consider secondly, the, the Moravian prayer revival. The Moravian community in Herrenhut, Saxony, in 1727, started a round-the-clock, 24-hour prayer watch that continued. Listen to this. 24 hours non-stop that continued for 100 years. After 65 years into it, the, the, the small Moravian community had sent 300 missionaries out into the world. 300 missionaries, 65 years into that prayer revival to bring the gospel and plant churches to peoples around the earth. Wow. It's amazing what God did in and through them. It seems there's a direct correlation to fervent, passionate prayer and global evangelization of all the peoples of the earth. Someone said, when God gets ready to do a great work, He starts His people to pray. I mean, he, he could do it without us, couldn't He? But He wants to work in and through us. And so when He gets ready to do something great, something eternally significant, He starts His people to pray. Hey, true life, could God, could God get us in on something that He wants to do that's great and eternally significant? God's heart is for the nations. Secondly, God's heart for the nations includes our household. The New Testament word translated household is the word oikos. I know you thought that that was just a popular Greek yogurt, but it's more than that, okay? Oikos is the word, and it basically just means household, where, you know, an inhabited household, an inhabited home, just like you would think. But by usage, it, the meaning is expanded to include not just your household, not just those under your roof, but it, it can include family, friends, cohorts, co-workers, teen, you know, uh, uh, 
fellow students, classmates. It can Im- include other people, the, the people in your circle of influence. That's, that's your household. That's your oikos. Acts chapter 5, for example, they taught and preached Christ from house to house, from oikos to oikos. Sounds like small groups, doesn't it? Small groups. Acts 11, 12 through 14, Peter's account of Cornelius and his household. When he got back to Jerusalem, he gave a report. And this is what he said in his report in, in verses 12 to 14. Peter, Peter said, Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren, and I guess he pointed to them, you know, these guys right here accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. Talking about Cornelius. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household, there's the word, oikos, will be saved. And then in chapter 10, verse 24 of Acts, Cornelius, it says, was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. His network of influence. His relatives and close friends. He had called them under his roof to hear the message from Simon Peter that he gave to them, these Gentiles, and they believed and were saved. Hallelujah. And that's how it works. Amen? That's a, that's a pattern in the New Testament. Other examples are, are Lydia and the Philippian jailer. Their households along with them came to Christ, came to faith in Jesus Christ. Luke 8, 39, the demoniac. Once he was delivered, he wanted to go with Jesus, but Jesus sent him back and said, go back to your oikos and tell them all the great things God has done for you. And it says that he went and told the whole city. I guess the whole city was his oikos. <laughs> right? The whole city. What's the point? The point is that God calls us, calls us to Himself and then puts us on mission with Him to reach our, our family, to reach our friends, to pray for and, and pray into the kingdom, our classmates, our co-workers, those around us, people in our network. And to not stop there, but to look out to the fields that are white under harvest, the nations, the people groups, the untold millions who have never heard before. How that they can come to faith in Jesus Christ and be saved. Thank you, darling. God calls us to Himself and puts us on mission. On His mission. To the world. God's heart for the nations includes our oikos. Now, if this is the heart of God, and it is, and prayer is all about conforming our will to His will, and it is, how then shall we pray? How then should we pray? Let me ask you a question. For whom are you praying? Whose name are you faithfully, passionately calling out to the Lord? That they might be saved. You know, there are so many passages of Scripture on prayer, and we, we could talk about it for another 40 days. Amen? I mean, we could continue in this series. Jesus talks in, in one parable about persistent praying. Are you being persistent with God? Not letting go. Passionately, faithfully, calling out people in your oikos to the Lord. Has it occurred to you that that God can use you to to reach a people group? 
by your prayers? Thirdly, we, we, we've looked at God's heart for the nations and, and also for our household. But, but number three, let's look at praying the Scriptures. <clears throat> and actually, I meant to, to start with this passage. And like I said, this is really a topical message. And so we've not been you know, going verse by verse through any, any passage, but rather looking at several passages. But anyway... 1 John chapter 4, praying the Scriptures. And, and first of all, praying in confidence. How can we pray in confidence? Look at it in verses 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He does what? He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. You want to pray in confidence? Are, are, are you plagued with doubt when you come to prayer? Or, you, know, you just wonder, Lord, how can I be more confident in my praying? You want to pray in confidence? Pray the Word of God back to Him. How are you going to do that? You need to get God's Word in your heart. You need to know God's Word, or at least be in, in God's Word, be able to read God's Word and, and say, okay, Lord, that's what you said, that's your will, so I, I'm going to ask you for this. This right here, what you said. The confidence that we have is that we, when we ask in His name, in accordance to His will, when we pray in His will, He hears us. And we know when He hears us that we have the request when, uh, that we have asked of Him. We know that when He hears us because we've asked in His name in accordance to His will that He hears us and that He, ha and that he answers our requests. You can pray in confidence. And that leads us to the second one. Abiding in Christ and in His Word. And His Word abiding in us. John 15, 7. If you abide, Jesus says. If you abide, that is, remain. Think of it as stay grounded in or rooted in or connected to. Like the vine is connected to the root. The, the branch, excuse me, is, is connected to the root. It's connected to the vine. Where does that branch get its source of life and everything that it needs? It gets it through the root, through the branch. Excuse me, through the vine. And so, we stay connected. He said, uh, he said, if you abide, you, if you remain, if you stay connected uh, and my words abide or remain in you, you, at, you shall ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. And just like we've said before, none of these passages are just like a blank check. I mean, it's all according to the will of God, right? You, you look at it in, in the context of, of, of overall Scripture. But, but he's, what a wonderful, powerful promise this is. Amen? Now, how do you abide in Him if not by staying in His Word? If not by staying connected with Him in prayer? If not by walking with Him on a daily basis, staying in communion with Him by prayer and through His Word? How, how are you going to abide in Him if, if not by doing that? How are you going to remain unless you nurture that relationship with Him that He has called you to? And then it says His Word abiding in us. How, how is that possible? you got to read it. Amen. you got to study it. you got to hear it. I mean, even, even if you're, you don't like to read, you can, you can listen to it all day long these days, you know. You can listen to it on podcasts and, and whatever. Read it. Study it. Memorize it. Meditate on it. That is, consider it. Think about it. Let it take root in your heart and life. Life. Let it change the way you think. Change your belief system. Change your worldview. Let it 
transform your life. He says we, we, we are foreordained to be conformed to His image. How does that play, take place? By the transforming of the renewing of our mind as we stay in the Word of God. What you really believe gets fleshed out in, in how you live. Right? And what you really believe affects the way you pray. And the way you talk to God. If, you, if you're hiding God's Word in your heart, you're memorizing it, you're meditating on it, you're considering it, you're staying in it, you're allowing it to root in your heart and your mind, your life, transform you, then you're going to be able to pray His promises, His Word back to Him. That's how it works. And Jesus said, when that happens... And, and your life and your mind and your heart begins to be transformed to the heart of God, then, hey, ask whatever you want. God's going to give it to you. Because why? Because you're asking in, in obedience and in, in, in accordance with His heart. And then the greater works of Christ. John 14, 12 to 14. Jesus said, truly, truly, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. What are the greater works of Christ? Well, briefly, the same kinds of works that Christ did, right? Because he said, the, the works that I do, he will do also. In other words, the same quality of works, the same kinds of works. Same in quality. He said, because the works that I do, you will do also. Because uh, he's, he's going back to his Father. He said, I go to my Father. He went away to his Father after three years of ministry in a very isolated area in the world. But when he went back to his Father, he, he sent his Holy Spirit, right? To live with us, to walk with us. And now his followers that he commissioned, they do the same works that he does. But how do we do these works? Well, look, see how the, the verse 12 is directly connected with what follows in verse 13 and 14. He said, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that my Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. The greater works of Christ that Bible scholars and students have argued about for ages what that actually is. I just gave you a brief summary of what I think it, it means. The greater works of Christ, how, how do we do that? He answers it in verse 13 and 14. Whatever you ask in my name. Prayer. Prayer. Ask in my name, and you'll have it. It's the same concept that we, we looked at already. When we come to God, when, we, when our hearts and minds and lives are transformed, and we get on our heart the same thing that God has on His heart, then we pray in accordance to His will, and God hears and He answers. Listen, prayer is not what we do before we, we do God's work. It's not what we do before we do God's work. Prayer is the work. It's not, it's not starting with prayer and, and then that's... Then we go about the work. No. Prayer is the work. From beginning to end. And all between. You have other verses in your outline that, that you can read and look over. But let me point out a few practical suggestions. First of all, set aside a time each day that you persistently pray in the Spirit for those who need to be saved. Are you doing that already? If not, now when? You know, God, God, has, God has spoken to you, no doubt, several times. 
about the importance of spending time in prayer, spending time in quiet time every day. Are you doing that? Are you calling those names out to God in prayer? Make a list of people, family and friends for whom you're praying. Pray for them persistently, faithfully, passionately. Believe God. Pray them like John Hyde, praying Hyde, he was called. Prayed countless of people into the kingdom of God. Pray regularly for missionaries and or unreached people groups. God can use your prayer like a, like a, like a missile launched into a place that we otherwise may not be able to go. God can use our prayers like a missile launched into that place to change the whole outlook, the layout of that land, and see people come to Christ, see people groups come to Christ. Meet with a friend. Set a reminder on your phone. Meet with a friend or a group to pray every week. Have reminders on your mirror, in your car, on your fridge to pray for the lost and the unreached. Just don't crash while you're going down the road, you know, looking at that reminder. I heard about someone who fasted a meal every week, every week and, and spent concentrated time with other family members praying for a, a, a wayward family member who is away from God. That's a good idea. Just fast one meal a week. That's a great suggestion as well. Just one meal a week. And spend that time that you would normally spend preparing and, 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 and buying and, and preparing and getting that meal ready and eating it. Spend that time rather looking into God's Word, getting into God's Word, letting it get into you and, and then praying His Word back to Him and calling out those names to the Lord. That people group that, that we went to, the Walla people, had the reputation of, of driving people out of their village that, that came to them with the gospel. But down in Ghana, we, we took a, grou- a group of students, college students, down into some of those villages, isolated, remote villages. And we talked to them. We told them who we were and what we wanted to do, that we would like to come in and talk about Nabi Isa, the, the Arabic term for the prophet Jesus, and, 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 and teach about him to those who are interested to hearing about Jesus Christ. And, and, and they invited us back. And so we went back and we preached God's Word in several of those villages. One village called Jayiri. Jayiri. The Walla people who had the reputation to be Walla is to be Muslim. 99.75% in Islam. Those Walla people came together, heard the Word of God, over 50 of them prayed to receive Jesus Christ and received Him. There was a group started there that became a church. Basically, the same thing happened in Tuosa. Same thing happened in Tisa. And there were two or three other villages. The same thing kind of thing, thing happened. We saw several churches planted among the Walla to the praise and glory of His holy name. Amen? Amen. Strategic prayer begins with a relationship to God. He calls us to Himself and into His mission to reconcile the nations to Himself. When we pray in accordance to His will and plan, He hears us and He answers and He moves. And He does things that are only God's eyes. Only, only things that only God can do. Amen? We're going to have a time of prayer as we've been doing. We're going to use this side of the, the platform. We turn it into a prayer altar. And this side, if you would just want to come and spend time with the Lord alone, and uh, you can do that. We'll respect that. And we'll pray for you from a distance. If you want to come to this side, you're saying that, that you'd like to, for someone to pray with you. And we'd love to, to come and pray with you as well. Let's stand together. Shane's going to come. 
want to bow our heads and, and pray and then, and then go into this time of prayer. What does God want to do in your heart, in your life? What does God want to do through you? Is He calling you to Himself? Is He, is he calling you to be on mission with Him? To reach the lost, to reach the nations. There are many other scriptures that we could talk about how you could pray back to God. You can pray that the Holy Spirit will do His work of convicting and convincing someone of their sin, of their need of Jesus Christ. You can pray that, that Jesus would regenerate them by His Holy Spirit. You can pray that, that they would see God's goodness and, and, and get under conviction and, and come to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. For whom are you praying? Maybe you just want to come and, and pray for someone else. Maybe God's spoken to your heart about praying for others. Could God, could God call you to Himself and then take you to an unreached people group in the world? Listen, millions, untold millions remain untold. Father, we pray that you would be honored and glorified in our lives today. We pray, God, that you would move by the power of your Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives, that you would change us draw us draw us to your heart oh God draw us to your heart conform us to the image of your son our Lord and Savior Jesus make us fervent in prayer strategic in prayer that lives might be changed transformed brought to Christ put on the road to discipleship following Jesus and making and being fishers of others fishers of men Lord have your will and way and we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus name while Shane sings you can sing, but if you need to come and pray, please come and pray. We're here. If you need someone to pray with you, maybe grab someone that you trust and have them come pray with you. Whatever God leads you to do, let's spend this time in prayer and in praise seeking the Lord.
guys, people said, amen. Let me, let me share just a couple of, couple of announcements with you. Thank you again for being here. Um, fill out your connection card, particularly if you're, you're new with us and you have something to communicate to us, even if it's just a prayer request, you can put that on the back of your connection card and, and put it in one of these offering boxes that is by the back door. Sunday, March 4th, praise and prayer. It's always a wonderful time. This is going to be a great time for us to come and kind of put a cap on our 40 days of prayer series uh, that we'll do Sunday night. Sunday night, 6 o'clock, praise and prayer, testimony time to hear the, 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 the answers to prayer that God we've seen God do in our lives. So be, uh, be aware of that and, and looking forward to that. Thirdly, we have a spot open on the April trip to Honduras. So if you're interested in going, particularly, uh, we need someone who has some construction experience. So uh, if that interests you, you can see uh, uh, some, of, some of our, see any of us, and, and we'll try to help you figure out what to do and, and how to go about that. And speaking of Honduras, pray for our Honduras team coming back tomorrow, uh, that God will get them back here safely and uh, from what we hear and understand, everything is going fine. Everything's going great. And so thank you for your prayers for the team. Thank you for being here today. May the Lord bless you. Go with God.